Chapter Nine of Havoc by E. Phillips Oppenheim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Chapter Nine: Robbing the Dead. The roar of the day was long since over. The rattle of vehicles, the tinkling of hansom bells, the tooting of horns from motor cars and cabs. The ceaseless tramp of footsteps all had died away. Outside the streets were almost deserted. An occasional wayfarer passed along the flagged pavement with speedy footsteps. Here and there a few lights glimmered at the lights of some of the larger blocks of offices. The bustle of the day was finished. There is no place in London so strangely quiet as the narrow thoroughfares of the city proper when the hour approaches midnight. Laverick, who since his partner's departure had been studying with infinite care his private ledger, closed it at last with a little snap, and leaned back in his chair. After all, save that he had got rid of Morrison, it had been a wasted evening. Not even he, whose financial astuteness no man had ever questioned, could raise from those piles of figures any other answer save the one inevitable one the knowledge of which had been like a black nightmare stalking by his side for the last thirty-six hours. One by one during the evening his clerks had left him, and it was a proof not only of his wonderful self-control, but also of the confidence which he invariably inspired, that not a single one of them had the slightest idea how things were. Not a soul knew that the firm of Laverick and Morrison was already practically derelict, that they had on the morrow twenty-five thousand pounds to find, neither credit nor balance at their bankers, and eight hundred and fifty pounds in the safe. Laverick, haggard from his long vigil, locked up his books at last, turned out the lights, and locking the doors behind him, walked into the silent street. Instinctively he turned his steps westward. This might well be the last night on which he would care to show himself in his accustomed haunts, the last night on which he could mix with his fellows freely and without that terrible sense of consciousness which follows upon disaster. Already there was little enough left of it. It was too late to change and go to his club. The places of amusement were already closed. Tomorrow night both club and theatres would lie outside his world. He walked slowly, yet he had scarcely taken, in fact, a dozen steps, when, with a purely mechanical impulse, he paused by a stone-flagged entry to light a cigarette. It was a passage, almost a tunnel for a few yards, leading to an open space, on one side of which was an old churchyard, strange survival in such a part, and on the other the offices of several firms of stockbrokers, a Russian banker, an actuary. It was the barest of impulses which led him to glance up the entry before he blew out the match. Then he gave a quick start, and became for a moment paralyzed. Within a few feet of him something was lying on the ground. A dark mass, black and soft. The body of a man, perhaps. Just above it a pair of eyes gleamed at him through the semi-darkness. Laverick at first had no thought of tragedy. It might be a tramp or a drunkard, perhaps, a fight or a man taken ill. Then something sinister about the light of those burning eyes set his heart beating faster. He struck another match with firm fingers and bent forward. What he saw upon the ground made him feel a little sick. What he saw racing away down the passage prompted him to swift pursuit. Down the arched court into the open space he ran, himself an athlete but mocked by the swiftness of the shadow-like form which he pursued. At the end was another street, empty. He looked up and down, seeking in vain for any signs of life. There was nothing to tell him which way to turn. Opposite was a very labyrinth of courts and turnings. There was not even the sound of a footfall to guide him. Slowly he retraced his steps, lit another match, and leaned over the prostrate figure. Then he knew that it was a tragedy indeed upon which he had stumbled. The man was dead, and he had met with his death by unusual means. These were the first two things of which Laverick assured himself. Without any doubt a savage and a terrible crime had been committed. 
a horn-handled knife of unusual length had been driven up to the hilt through the heart of the murdered man. There had been other blows, notably about the head. There was not much blood, but the position of the knife alone told its ugly story. Laverick, though his nerves were of the strongest, felt his head swim as he looked. He rose to his feet and walked to the opening of the passage, gasping. The street was no longer empty. About thirty yards away, looking westwards, a man was standing in the middle of the road. The light from the lamppost escaped his face. Laverick could only see that he was slim, of medium height, dressed in dark clothes, with his hands in the pockets of his overcoat. To all appearance he was watching the entry. Laverick took a step towards him. The man as deliberately took a step further away. Laverick held up his hand. Hello, he called out, and beckoned. The person addressed took no notice. Laverick advanced another two or three steps. The man retreated a similar distance. Laverick changed his tactics and made a sudden spring forward. The man hesitated no longer. He turned and ran as though for his life. In a few minutes he was round the corner of the street and out of sight. Laverick returned slowly to the entry. A distant clock struck midnight. A couple of clerks came along the pavement on the other side, their hands and arms full of letters. Laverick hesitated. He was never afterwards able to account for the impulse which prevented his calling out to them. Instead he lurked in the shadows and watched them go by. When he was sure that they had disappeared, he bent once more over the body of the murdered man. Already that huddled-up heap was beginning to exercise a nameless and terrible fascination for him. His first feelings of horror were mingled now with an insatiable curiosity. What manner of man was he? He was tall and strongly built, fair of almost florid complexion. His clothes were very shabby and apparently ready-made. His moustache was upturned and his hair was trimmed closer than is the custom amongst Englishmen. Laverick stooped lower and lower until he found himself almost on his knees. There was something projecting from the man's pocket, as though it had been half snatched out. A large portfolio of brown leather, almost the size of a satchel. Laverick drew it out, holding it in one hand, whilst with firm fingers he struck another match. Then, for the first time, a little cry broke from his lips. Both sides of the pocketbook were filled with banknotes. As his match flickered out, he caught a glimpse of the figures in the left-hand corner, five hundred pounds, great rolls of them. Laverick rose, gasping to his feet. It was a new Arabian Nights, this, a dream, a continuation of the nightmare which had threatened him all day. Or was it perhaps the madness coming? the madness which he had begun only an hour or so ago to fear. He walked into the gas-lit streets and looked up and down. The mysterious stranger had vanished. There was not a soul in sight. He clutched the rough stone wall with his hands. He kicked the pavement with his heels. There was no doubt about it. Everything around him was real. Most real of all was the fact that within a few feet of him lay a murdered man, and that in his hands was that brown leather pocket-book with its miraculous contents. For the last time Laverick retraced his steps and bent over that huddled-up shape. One by one he went through the other pockets. There was a packet of Russian cigarettes, an empty card-case of chased silver and obviously a foreign workmanship, a cigarette-holder stained with much use but of the finest amber with rich gold mountings. There was nothing else upon the dead man, no means of identification of any sort. Laverick stood up giddy, half terrified with the thoughts that went tearing through his brain. The pocketbook began to burn his hand. He felt the perspiration breaking out anew upon his forehead. Yet he never hesitated. He walked like a man in a dream, but his footsteps were steady and short. Deliberately and without any sign of hurry, he made his way towards his offices. If a policeman had come in sight up and down the street, he had decided to call him and to acquaint him with what had happened. It was the one chance he held against himself, the gambler's method of decision, perhaps, unconsciously arrived at. 
As it turned out, there was still not a soul in sight. Laverick opened the outer door with his latch-key, let himself in, and closed it. Then he groped his way through the clerk's office into his own room, switched on the electric light, and once more sat down before his desk. He drew his shaded writing-lamp towards him and looked around with a nervousness wholly unfamiliar. Then he opened the pocket-book, drew out the roll of banknotes, and counted them. It was curious that he felt no surprise at their value. Banknotes for five hundred pounds are not exactly common, and yet he proceeded with his task without the slightest instinct of surprise. Then he leaned back in his chair. Twenty thousand pounds, in Bank of England notes. There they lay on the table before him. A man had died for their sake. Another must go through all the days with the price of blood upon his head, a murderer, a haunted creature for the rest of his life and there, on the table, were the spoils. Laverick tried to think the matter out dispassionately. He was a man of average moral fiber, that is to say, he was honest in his dealings with other men, because his father and his grandfather before him had been honest, and because the penalty for dishonesty was shameful. Here, however, he was face to face with an altogether unusual problem. These notes belonged without a doubt to the dead man. Save for his own interference, they would have been in the hands of his murderer. The use of them for a few days could do no one any harm. Such risk as there was, he took himself. That it was a risk he knew and fully realized. Laverick had sat in his place unmoved when his partner had poured out his wail of fear and misery. Yet of the two men, it was probable that Laverick himself had felt their position the more keenly. He was a man of some social standing, with a large circle of friends, a sportsman and with many interests outside the daily routine of his city life. To him failure meant more than the loss of money. It would rob him of everything in life worth having. The days to come had been emptied of all promise. He had held himself stubbornly because he was a man, because he had strength enough to refuse to let his mind dwell upon the indignities and humiliation to come. And here before him was possible salvation. There was a price to be paid, of course, a risk to be run in making use even for an hour of this money. Yet from the first he had known that he had meant to do it. Quite cool now, he opened his private safe, thrust the pocketbook into one of the drawers, and locked it up. Then he lit a cigarette, finally shut up the office, and walked down the street. As he passed the entry, he turned his head slowly. Apparently no one had been there, nothing had been disturbed. Straining his eyes through the darkness, he could even see that dark shape still lying huddled up on the ground. Then he walked on. He had burned his boats now, and was prepared for all emergencies. At the corner he met a policeman to whom he wished a cheery good night. He told himself that the thing which he had done was for the best. He owed it to himself. He owed it to those who had trusted him. After all, it was the chief part of his life, his city career. It was here that his friends lived. It was here that his ambitions flourished. Disgrace here was eternal disgrace. His father and his grandfather before him had been men honored and respected in this same circle. Disgrace to him such disgrace as that with which he had stood face to face a few hours ago, would have been, in a certain sense, a reflection upon their memories. The names upon the brass plates to the right and to the left of him were the names of men he knew, men with whom he desired to stand well, whose friendship or content made life worth living on the reverse. It was worth a great risk, this effort of his to keep his place. His one mistake, this association with Morrison, had been such an unparalleled stroke of bad luck. He was rid of the fellow now. For the future there should be no more partners. He had his life to live. It was not reasonable that he should allow himself to be dragged down into the mire by such a creature. He found an empty taxicab at the corner of Queen Victoria Street and hailed it. Whitehall Court, he told the driver. End of chapter 9. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks.com.